So good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. <laughs> The ten thousand million galvas having it to see and then listen to to remember and accept. I vow to taste the truth of the Zagata's words. Good morning. Uh, we've been having a little problem here uh, with computers, but it seems to be working now. And um, uh, we moved. My, originally, my um, talk was in the, in the hut, the Tokusan hut, but now it's in my office. I'm sitting in the doorway of my office. Um, uh, so, you know, thanks for your patience and waiting. Um, Pencil. So this morning, I am going to talk about a subject, uh, which is three subjects. The three subjects are really one subject, and the one subject. Uh, is divided into three parts. So <clears throat> this is a, a um, uh, um, a Buddhist understanding of what was called emptiness. We talk a lot about emptiness. We read a lot about emptiness. And so I hope it's not a boring subject for you. <clears throat> you hear me okay? What about that? I hear, I see thumbs. That's yeah. better. Thank you. You're well, you're welcome. <laughs> we'll get there. We're getting there. We're climbing up this hill, you know. <laughs> Pretty soon we'll get to the subject. <laughs> so um, these are called um, uh, the three doors of liberation. How's that? I think it's okay. Thanks. Um, the three doors of liberation um, are emptiness, um, uh, signlessness, signless, and um, the wish list. So uh, we're very familiar with emptiness. <clears throat> but maybe not so familiar with signless and um, wish lists. So I will start with emptiness, uh, which is what all, what the Pragyaparamita Sutra is all about. Uh, um, uh, we say it's about emptiness, but it's also about form. I think we need to understand that the sutra is not just about emptiness, it's about form. It's about the emptiness of form and about the form of emptiness. So we use this term emptiness, and the problem with the term emptiness is that it means so many other things. So we have to focus on, when we're talking about emptiness, what we really mean by emptiness, because we can mean a lot of different things. Actually, in Buddha Dharma, the 20 um, meanings for the term emptiness, but they're all related. <clears throat> so, in order to 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 um, easily easily um, identify what we mean uh, in in the Dharma, uh, it means interdependence. Right? 
all created dharmas or things are um, empty of their own inherent existence. In other words, we're all dependent. There's nothing in this world that is not dependent on everything else. Right? Okay. So that's pretty easy. The problem is, how do we practice this? Is it just a theory? Is it just something that we chant every day? How do we actually practice emptiness? Do we want to practice emptiness? Is it worth practicing emptiness? So you can practice emptiness right here, right now. We understand it, and we don't understand it. So emptiness is a big koan for us. Form is a big koan for us. What is form? What are forms, basically? Of that emptiness is the emptiness of. What are forms? So forms being emptiness means that they are all all forms are interdependent with all other forms. That's why there's no special self. So when we understand this and can practice it, it is a form of liberation because we are trapped. <laughs> We're trapped in our bodies. We're trapped in our uh, circumstances. I don't want to say trapped, but uh, we are contained within that, within, and those containment containers can either be a trap for suffering or a doorway to liberation. It just depends on how we, uh, on our understanding and how we actually deal with our, the circumstances of our life. So this is, all, of course, connected with what we call karma. So if our actions are directed toward liberation, that's what we find. If our actions are directed toward confinement, then that's what we find. We put ourselves in jail, actually. You know, pe people are really caught. No matter what the circumstances are, Suzuki Roshi, I remember, oh, he said, don't get caught by anything. What is our practice? Don't get caught by anything. But we get caught by desire, uh, delusions, so uh, emptiness is a doorway to liberation. And it is a doorway to liberation if we practice it. This morning, when I was uh, sitting zazen, uh, you, 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 you were all lucky because um, you were sitting in the quietness of your home. <clears throat> I was sitting in a dokusan hut, and uh, around the begin, the end of the first period, <laughs> uh, someone started the construction part, a construction um, party, <laughs> in our. Uh, over the side of the fence, on the other side of the fence. And then I was um, thinking about, my first reaction was, um, oh my God, is this going to go on all day? I mean, it was really loud, everybody shouting and, and digging with shovels, and, and it was quite an uh, interesting situation. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not going to get up. I'm just going to sit here and to see what happens. And my first thought was of how I save myself. Uh, should I get up or not? But no, I just sat there. And it was a little bit annoying. If I didn't like it, it was annoying. If I didn't care whether I liked it or not, it was a lot easier. Not that I liked it, but I was able to um, instead of trying to escape from it, 
to go right into it. This is how we find our freedom. We There's no escape. The only escape is to be one with something. Because as long as we're only, only involved in our uh, dualistic thinking, as long as we are involved in our dualistic thinking, there's no escape. The only escape is to be one with everything. So I didn't try to be one. I didn't. I wasn't going to be a hero. It's just I found myself not worrying about it, even though it was pounding in my head. I just didn't worry about it. And so I, I thought, this is what I'm going to talk about today. How do? How do? I'm one of the things. How to um, find my freedom within an impossible situation. Um, so, how do we um, uh, see ourselves free from, how do we practice free from um, uh, desire, desiring too much, and uh, self um, pity. <laughs> We're full <both> self pity. <laughs> oh me, oh my. <laughs> Which brings us into the other two aspects which are the signless and the wishless. You know, um, uh, we see indirectly, most of the time we see indirectly. We don't, when I say see, means uh, uh, we, um, we see through signs. We invent words to stand for something. And we, uh, uh, words and, and concepts and ideas to stand for something. So then we name something. Russell Street. I'm on Russell Street. That's not untrue. But it's, it's, it limits my understanding. We have to limit our understanding in order to do anything. You know, if we don't have signs, if we don't have, um, uh, representations. It's really hard to um, move around with each other. So signs are representations. They are um, uh, little posters <laughs> or big posters that we invent in order to um, uh, um, to, to move with each other, to move around. Yeah, it's on it's on, uh, on Russell Street. Oh yeah, I know where that is. You know, so we need those things. We need signs, but the signs are representations, and our thinking is representational. So, we're. I don't want to say we're trapped in our mind, even though we are. But we need we need that that kind of confinement and differentiation. Right, it's important, but it's still a veil. It's it's a veil because we design our life to conform to the signs, and then we live in a in a in a life of signatures instead of breaking through to directly understanding or directly touching. So there are, you know, in uh, consciousness, um, there are three aspects. One is directly touching. This is called intuition, by the way. Intuition, directly touching without having to go through the, the machinery of thinking. It's just, there it is period. 
and then uh, uh, that's a doorway of liberation. See, we cling to the signs as our real life. And we don't want, that's, that's, the, that's the problem we have with birth and death. We don't want to die to the signs. <laughs> and as soon as the signs are taken away, we feel jittery, right? Because we depend on them. So instead of depending on our intuition or our directly touching, like animals do, uh, we depend on our on, our, on the signs that we agree on as reality. We all agree on these things. This is our America. We agree on <laughs> disagree, of course, <laughs> but everybody has some idea, you know, about. Um, how our society should act according to the signs. Uh, Lao Tzu, I, mean, uh, I think, you know, Lao Tzu is very wise, <laughs> saying, um, uh, you know, before there was, um, there were rules and regulations, everybody adapted to life perfectly. <laughs> Something like that. looking at the chat. Um, so um, here, here are some, well, so there's directly saying, that's intuition, that's freedom. The next sign, the next level of um, uh, uh, Um, consciousness is where we start to think. And we think the thinking is there uh, and it's, it's discursive, but it's simple. And then the third level of consciousness is where you elaborate on the thinking. That's my understanding. All three are necessary. But if we lose or are not aware of the first level, which is intuition, we're still living in a, uh, a world of signs. And it, um, so here are four signs that the Buddhists pay close attention to. One, the first self, the first sign is, I have a self. The second sign, I am a person. The third sign, I am a living being. The fourth sign, the fourth sign is. I have a lifespan that goes from my birthday, first one, to the last one, to the end. That, that expanse, that's the fourth sign. <clears throat> and he, um, so we say, when, when we realize the non-self, or the non-self, that's the doorway to liberation. We're liberated from ourselves, but we don't want to be eliminated from. <laughs> we don't want to be alienated from ourselves, but we we have to accept that fact. That's why it's so hard to die. When you realize that you are connected with everything, and that you are not a separate entity, it's not so hard to die but we hang on and <clears throat> those things that we can't um, um, handle, we just suffer with. That's what it's called, the life of suffering, Saha world, <clears throat> the world of suffering. And Buddha says, I only teach you how to deal with suffering. 
That's my message. So that's why we talk about these things. And, and uh, of course, we hear this all the time, right? And so we're sick of it. There's no self, no self, no self. <laughs> it's true. And, and we're, you know, sick of it because we can't do anything about it. But we can. We can do something about it. And then the idea of a person, meaning separate person. Our, our separation is necessary, otherwise we couldn't walk around, right? Eat and do all the things that we do. So it's necessary, you know, it's necessary to realize that we, um, that we have a self. It's necessary to realize that we are a person. It's necessary to realize that um, we have a lifespan, right? Except that these are all signatures. They're all signs. They're not truly true reality. They, they're secondary reality. They're not primary reality. So there's secondary reality and primary reality. <clears throat> so nirvana is reached uh, when we when we're no longer fooled by signs. So we keep making more and more signs. <laughs> <laughs> and keep, you know, struggling and struggling to make life more complex. We think that we're doing a great job making life more complex. Do you remember when we, the pandemic first started? Everybody rushing around like crazy without realizing that that's what we're doing. We kind of know that, but... And then the pandemic, and then boom. Everybody took a big breath. It was wonderful. <laughs> the first month was great because we're all just, you know, you couldn't do anything. And it wasn't our fault, <laughs> maybe. But then, you know, we're trying to, to make things work better. And we have to be very careful that we don't keep making ourselves more complicated, our life more and more complicated. This was a great treasure, this pause in, in, in our life. It, the skies cleared up, the water became more, less poisonous, everything was getting better. <laughs> and we kind of realized that, most some people, but everybody's still worrying. The main thing is that there is something called a lifespan. Yeah, I know. But it's not a true lifespan. It's just a lifespan for this particular um, world at this particular time, which concerns you and me. Because everybody goes through this. Nobody escapes. And I don't like people talking when I'm talking. Anyway, I can take it. Um, so the third one is called wish list. You see how these are all connected. Wish list means uh, letting go and appreciate appre being able to appreciate everything around us. Letting go and being able to appreciate everything around it just as it is, to accept myself just as I am. This is called um, virtue. It's like everyone has their own virtue, which is not the same as value. Value is comparison, right? So we stop comparing ourselves to other things. 
one of the driving factors in our life is that we're always comparing ourselves to other things. And when you think of and and the, the energy that's generated, we like to think of as progress. Competition. But wishlessness is um, beyond competition. It's actually called uh, nirvana, just dropping, just letting letting now be now, just letting this be this. So we live in our dream. It's like letting go of the dream, and that's scary because we depend on the dream. If we didn't have the dream, what would we do? We just have to go find another dream. Dreams are important. Absolutely. Dreams are important. To have something, a goal, is important. Absolutely. But to have find your freedom within the goal, um, which is beyond our wishes, So it, it's also characterized by not running after things. Uh, often I walk at, at night, I walk the streets. <laughs> Every night I walk the streets with my dog. And I come across all kinds of stuff on the corners. You know, all kinds of stuff. I get to, I would like to take that home. Gee, that's a, such a nice chair, you know. I did find a chair, a really good chair the other night. <laughs> and I took it home. And, but I often bring things home. And Liz, my wife, says, why did why you, why you bring that home? <laughs> and why did I bring that home? At the time, it looked really good. You know, like something I really <laughs> needed and wanted. But, you know, I bring all these useless things home. So I, I, I'm very conscious and aware, you know, of um, uh, how to of how I should control my wishes. And believe it or not, after 91 years, I realized that if you follow what you want, that's what you get. So you have to be very careful. Problem in our society, our society, is that uh, there's so much that's being pushed on us that, and everyone has a better, a better one than the next one, and so we're, we're very confused. I remember when I, I sent. Uh, where, um, my son Daniel, my son Daniel uh, went to um, uh, uh, um, uh, to college. He um, uh, he he roomed with four or five other students, and one of them was very wealthy. Actually, the guy who owned the house. His father, his parents were very wealthy. So um, he opened the garage door, and there's a motorboat and a bicycle and a motorcycle and everything you can possibly think of, you know, that would please a kid. And the kid was so miserable. <laughs> he was really miserable. Um, there's all this stuff that you use it for a little while and then go to the next one for a little while. There's no, nothing basic about his life. So these are these three characteristics. Um, uh, are actually how we bring peace into the world. The, wor the world, <laughs> the world depends on these three characteristics. Understanding the empty nature of all things, beings, the interdependent nature of all beings. Um, getting beyond signs 
so we can touch directly the reality and that we're not fooled by literature, <laughs> not fooled by signs, not fooled by ideas, but getting our juice directly from the source. So easy to fool people. Mr. Trump is out there with 25,000 lies, which are all signs that we're supposed to believe. Can you imagine that? And people, what are they thinking? Anyway, I don't want, I'm not going into politics. I'm just using that as an illustration. <laughs> and then um, toning down your wish list and being able to appreciate what we already have. So that's what we practice Zazen. I'm a, I'm a uh, advocate for Zazen. <laughs> That's why we're sitting here with nothing. We have nothing. And, and when you can actually deeply understand that, you don't have any suffering. So this is plain, uh, plain chain Buddhism. Don't cause yourself a lot of problems. And um, you know, in Zazen, we let go, we offer ourselves to emptiness and to signlessness and to a wishlessness. We don't hanker after anything. We let go of all the verbiage and all the signs, and simply give ourselves to reality, which is emptiness, our form. Enjoying our forms, even if we're not well, you can do that. I have a little poem here by Thich Nhat Hanh. <clears throat> so he says, Waking up this morning, I smile. 24 brand new hours are before me. I vow to live fully on each moment and to look at things, look at all things with the eyes of love. Four lines, very simple, very direct, and very true. That's all you need. And that's our thought just before we sit Zazen the first thing in the morning. And then when we sit, we let go of all that. And then when we get back up, we take it up. So uh, the doorways of liberation uh, are nirvana. That dropping everything, wishing just for the well-being of all beings is enough. That's nirvana. But, you know, because we're people with busy minds, <laughs> we are uh, busy bodies, we're busy bodies and busy minds. 
And so we need something for our busy bodies and our busy minds to do. But our busy bodies and our busy minds uh, just can just uh, practice nirvana, emptiness and, and form. The forms of emptiness and emptiness of, of forms are the most important thing in our life. So practice, Prajnaparamita is not to be studied. It is to be studied, but it's actually to be practiced. If you only study it, there's something missing. So when we practice it, it's helpful to study it as well. Because we, although we directly touch, it's also important to share our understanding with the ancestors. What did they say about this? How did they approach it? How do they understand it? And all that comes down to us to help us to practice. So study and practice, but study the right things. So that you stay on the right track. I feel right. <laughs> well, I want to feel right. So I, I can't say that I'm a great advocate, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good, but, uh, or an example, I'm okay. But nevertheless, I don't worry about that too much. I just do what I do. And I try real hard to stay on track. One of the things that I'm a little concerned about, I don't know if it's if it's correct or not, but I worry about our practice falling to pieces. <laughs> not falling, I don't think our practice will fall to pieces, but I, I'm, I'm a little concerned that because there's no, uh, um, th the only thing that's keeping us together is our memory of practice <laughs> together. Uh, there are other things that keep us together too. We, we all have uh, um, really uh, sincere practice, but I'm, I'm worried that we will uh, lay back too much because there's nobody pushing us, nobody propping us up. And uh, I, I'm concerned that we will um, just take it easy, you know, I think to a certain extent it's good because we're recovering from our the pandemic before the pandemic. <laughs> the pandemic before the pandemic pandemic is our being pushed around by our desires. That was a real pandemic. Killed a lot of people. It made a lot of people sick. Now we're kind of healing, even though we're in the midst of this terrible pandemic and sickness. Everything is got. It's, everything appears with its opposite. That if we understand that everything appears with its opposite, we won't worry too much. This too will pass, and its opposite will appear as, as the dominant, and then that too will pass, and its opposite will appear as the dominant. That's the way it is. One thing follows the other, like. The cart follows the horse. The cart and the horse. You may, you may not. The cart doesn't work without the horse. And the heart and and uh, uh, the horse, the horse, <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, carries all the baggage. <laughs> So wasn't it great to not have any baggage for a month? I mean, you didn't have to go hiking, you know, or camping or anything like that. Just free. <laughs> so we had our freedom for about a month, and now it's coming back, you know. How can we trap ourselves more? So be careful. <laughs> Do you have a question? If anybody has some kind of burning question or something, 
where are we? Oh, Ross. Tika. Hi. Um, so I'm sharing Ross's computer. And um, up, 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 up. If uh, anyone would like to ask a question at this point, okay. I see some hands already going up, but I will explain. Um, you just go down to the participants at the bottom of your screen, open that up, and then a blue box will appear and it says raise hand. So you can just click that area. If you want to type your question in, type it and send it to Ross, who's the co-host, so that I can see that and he and I can manage that together. And unfortunately, just on the computer, we probably won't see your your human hand. I'm so sorry. Uh, so either type your question or raise your blue hand. Ellen, uh, you are now ready to ask a question. Please lower your hand. Uh, lower my hand, okay. Uh, want me to lower my hand? Okay. I'll, I'll take care of it. Okay. I, <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask my question, even though I can't see Sotin yet. Um, so I um, also really noticed that month after uh, we were all kind of uh, locked down, and many, many people I know spoke to me about how wonderful it was to suddenly, you know, stop or pause. And I'm curious, you know, what the enticement of busyness is. What is it that, you know, draws people, even though they were so clear about how great it was to not be busy, they were drawn into being busy and they, I think they wanted to be drawn into it. And I'm just so curious about that. Yeah. I remember when um, uh, back in 2000 or something like that, when uh, we had the earthquake and the Bay Bridge lost its roadway. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And so everybody had to go to, to um, unless they went, drove way around, they had to... Um, go by ferry. And I used to take the ferry. I was abbot at San Francisco Zen Center at the time. I would ride my bike down to the ferry, uh, Berkeley Ferry, and then put the, my bike on the ferry. And it was the most wonderful trip across the bridge, or across the bay. All these ships and the water and the birds. And it's like a whole different world of refreshment. That was the most refreshing thing that happened to me in years. And I would do that three or four times a, a week. And uh, then drive my bike, ride my bike up Market Street to the Zen Center. Um, and as soon as the bridge became repaired, everybody everybody went back to the bridge, <laughs> which is smoky and traffic -y and, you know, stop and go and, um, you know, and we tried to get, you know, stay have that ferry stay open, but all the ridership disappeared into the into hell. <laughs> they exchanged heaven for hell, <laughs> so to speak. So, so what's the appeal of that? What is what is it? I mean, I know you know some people need to move faster, but. You know, during this time, people really wanted to. Well, yes. So the problem is you have to go to work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's the way it is, you know. It's our, uh, part of our interdependent life is that everybody has to work so that everybody can stay, you know, uh, uh, eat and so forth. So we're, that's where, what we're working with right now. There's nothing for people to do. So many people to do, uh, and they have to start doing something. So that's the other side. Well, that is the other side, and I really honor that. But I'm talking about people who are, you know, not working for one reason or another, and still they're drawn toward, you know, just accelerating their lives. It's because they're used to it. We just we just depend on what we're used to. It's hard to switch from depending on what we're used to, to letting go. That's it's it's not easy. 
it is not easy. Nevertheless, that's the road, but it's the road less taken. That's all. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Sojin, Blake has a question. When you correct someone's posture in the Zendo, how is this done wishlessly? You see a need and you respond to it. Okay. Uh, Karen Zendheim, you're next. Please ask your question. Thank you, Sojin. Um, last week, last Saturday, you said thinking is imagination. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little more about that, please? Yes. Yeah, well, uh, imagination is creating images, right? Yes. So you were always creating images. That's, that's called... Um, uh, signs. We create the image to represent the thing. So representation, representations are called signs. They are the imaginative um, uh, representation of the actual. All of our, um, there are, you know, the, it's really hard to separate, you know, what is act completely touch directly touching and what is imagination. It's not always easy to separate this. It's a it's a wavy line. It's not a fine line. So, um, uh, when when you when you go to the beach and you run into the ocean, and that cold water hits you, <laughs> that's directly touching. <laughs> That's just one example. You're dreaming about the beach. I remember when I was a kid, you know, we used to drive to Venice Beach from Hollywood. I was about six or five or something. And as soon as we get down to the to where the beach was, I could I was just in my imagination was just going like crazy. When will we get to the that place where there's a V, which is where the the road hits the beach? There's the beach. I can smell the salt water. I can smell the salt water two two miles away. That's directly touching. Being outdoors is really good for people. Does the dualistic trap that we live in, does that begin with thought? Yes. Yes. This thought is discrimination and discrimination. You can go in and sit in your chair and then I'm going to come help you. Okay. Help me wipe your back off. <laughs> whatever you want to do. There I you go. Yeah. Whatever you do, I trust you. Thank you. So, I didn't hear the answer to my question because I know I'm still, I'm still working on your question. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a little bump. Don't worry about it. Don't get mad. <laughs> I'm not. So thinking, um, is, um, anything you say is discriminative. We can't help ourselves unless we do, unless we're conscious of what we're doing. Because it's very easy to fall into, into discriminating thinking. We're always, that's why we have koans. The koans that we study are about non-discrimination and about the discrimination of non-discrimination and the non-discrimination of discrimination. You may sound, that may sound garbled, but it's the truth because everything, every time we open our mouth, we're talking, we're, we're, we're uh, uh, separating ourselves. So thinking, we can think, we don't have to speak with thinking discriminatively and acting discriminatively, but it's necessary. 
it's necessary to act to We're discriminating constantly. There's not a moment when we're not discriminating. I decide to do this rather than not do that, right? So discrimination is important, but because our mind is always discriminating, we don't pay attention to the non-discrimination, which is directly touching the truth because there's no division. So there's the secondary truth and the primary truth. The secondary truth is, dis is discriminating truth. The non-discriminating truth is, um, the, is when we're not thinking or when we're thinking non-discriminatively, which is difficult. That's why, does the dog have the Buddha nature? No. Well, I thought the dog had Buddha nature. No. Then Joshua asked another monk, does the dog have Buddha nature? Buddha nature? He said, of course, which is true. That's why it's a koan. Do you exist as a person? Well, yeah. Joshi would say, no. And then ask him again, you say, well, of course. So what is it? Is it yes or is it no? Do you exist as a person or don't you? It's both and. Where does the where does history or the past moment meet the next moment? in a universe where everything is changing without stopping. If there's no stopping, how can one thing be another? It's all just one whirling ball. It never stops. Except that it's perfectly still at the same time. That's why when we drop our um, wishlessness, which is discriminating, we, we enter the, the realm of nirvana. Just to drop our discriminating mind, and it's all one. That's why we said zazen. <laughs> Just to stop our discriminating mind. I mean, stop, meaning don't pick things up. Don't get caught by anything. We live in the whirling ball of everything, of, of chaos within, within uh, order and order within chaos. You can't have one without the other. You can't, that's, that's our song, should be our song. You can't have one without the other. Sorry, the way it is. <laughs> Change it if you can. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Sojin Roshi, and everyone who asked questions today. Uh, it appears that by the look of the clock, it's time to end our lecture. Okay. And I encourage people, and question and answer, and I encourage people who had questions who were not able to ask, uh, perhaps to sign up for Shosan. Uh, Gary Artem sends out uh, notices around that uh, event, and you can ask a question of Sojin on a, a Thursday evening, and the dates are listed on the website. And you don't have to be a uh, seasoned Zen student to do that. That's correct. Old moldy Zen students or new <laughs> freshman students. Yeah, it's open season. <laughs> um, Thank you. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day of zazen, and um, keep your back straight and deep, breathe deeply. Being on your language, I will
thoughts are awakened within them. The illusions are inexhaustible. I vow to win them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. Buddha's way is unsurpassable. I vow to become it.